It is a joy to worship with you on this last Sunday of our summer sermon series, focusing on the elements, oil, water, and fire. Today we'll end with a reflection on the powerful symbolism of water, even though it's only indirectly mentioned in today's scripture. So every pastor I know when approaching the pulpit to preach silently prays, oh God, help me get out of your way. Well, that's already been done. So will you join me in our prayer of confess, uh, illumination? Almighty God, in you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom. Through Christ our Lord, amen. I invite you to listen now to the word of God as it comes to us from the gospel of Mark, chapter seven, selected verses. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash. And there were also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups and pots and bronze kettles and beds. So the Pharisees and scribes ask him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human concepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called to the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, understand, there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, debauchery, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As a child, the dialogue with my mother sometimes went like this. Mom, go take a bath. Me, I don't want to. Go get cleaned up. Why? because you're filthy, you need a bath, and besides, cleanliness is next to godliness. If I heard that once, I heard it a thousand times, and it always puzzled me, but her tone became more and more strident, so I wisely complied. But I wonder, is cleanliness really next to godliness? Let's give it some thought, and maybe today, we'll find out if it's true. So in our scripture this morning, we find Jesus and his disciples having recently arrived in Gensaray. They sat down to eat supper, and the next thing they know, the Pharisees and scribes show up, apparently just in from Jerusalem. I wondered whether they had come to check up on Jesus or they just happened to be passing by, but Jerusalem was about 35 miles away, so it took some effort to travel that far. They asked Jesus why some of his disciples were eating defiled with defiled hands. That makes me wonder a lot of things. How did they know the hands were defiled? Did they witness the disciples not washing? What had the disciples done that might have made them unclean? You see, the Pharisees scrupulously followed this priestly tradition that was handed down over generations having evolved from Levitical law. It required the ritual washing of their hands and food before eating. If you've ever read Leviticus, you know there are a lot of laws. 
over 250 just in Leviticus alone, according to some counts. Ordinary activities like childbirth, marital relations, touching any body fluid, touching a sick or a dead person would make a person ritually unclean. That is, not acceptable to perform ritualistic duties. It was not a sin to become unclean, but it was wrong not to cleanse properly before performing sacred duties, like preparing and eating the sacrificial meal. Once unclean, bathing in water was required to become clean again, and not to wash or bathe left a person spoiled, unsanctified, unholy, unacceptable to God, defiled. There were no laws specifically saying that hands and food needed to be washed before meals, only that hands and feet needed to be washed before performing a sacrifice or partaking in the sacrificial meal. The thing is, there were obviously good reasons for a lot of these laws. Washing foods and hands before eating is still a very good idea. The tradition evolved and good practice became ritual. In the elders' tradition, hands that had not been washed with water were unclean and defiled and unacceptable to God. So when they asked Jesus why some of the disciples hadn't washed their hands, Jesus did what he usually did. He had a teaching moment. But instead of answering a question with a question, this time he did not mince words. The question seemed to have angered Jesus. At least that's kind of how I read it. Maybe he was angry on behalf of the disciples who had sacrificed so much to follow him. And remember, the Pharisees were important and influential leaders of the faith. They were pious and cloaked in righteousness. And I suspect they were not used to being questioned or spoken back to. Maybe the Pharisees really were shocked to see Jesus' disciples failing to wash their hands before eating. And maybe they were truly concerned that they were not showing the proper reverence for the traditions. But I have to wonder if the Pharisees really cared whether the disciples' hands were clean or not. I suspect they were more interested in appearing holy in front of the crowd, appearing righteous and superior, holier than thou, simply because they were seen performing the ritual. They were saying, look how faithful we are, while scolding Jesus and his followers. That's when Jesus went off on them, citing Isaiah and calling them hypocrites, saying, you worship with your lips, but turn around and do something else. He was criticizing the fact that they thought the ritual itself was what made them worthy and clean, and that the disciples were unclean while their own hearts were corrupt. Maybe they worshiped the ritual more than God. The ritual had become the doctrine. I think they were more hung up on the ritual than what was most important to God. I think Jesus was saying, you're hypocrites whose lives are lived out to fool others. But notice that Jesus did not condemn the ritual itself. I mean, certainly rituals are very good and useful. We gain our identity from rituals. They give us a sense of order, continuity, security. They reinforce our faith and demonstrate to others who we are and what we believe when used properly. But the ritual itself is not the doctrine. It, when it is worshiped as such, it dishonors God. The ritual itself is not what makes us holy. Our own PC USA has a beautiful ritual. Our worship is ordered in a certain way for specific reasons. Our sacred rituals include sacraments given by Jesus and are undoubtedly the most powerful of all. But if we speak the right words at communion and turn around and do something else, we dishonor God. Well, the teaching moment continued. Then Jesus spoke to the crowd around him and said, listen to me, all of you. He explained there's nothing from outside that can defile a person. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. And he had this whole long list of things that were wicked. All these evil things come from within and they defile the person. Jesus said it's not what goes into our mouths that defile us. It's not unwashed food eaten with dirty hands. It is what 
because our hearts are the center of our thoughts and our beliefs and our attitudes, our minds and our decision making, the thoughts that come from within our hearts are the roots of our actions and words. Our language and deeds are really only symptomatic of what's in our hearts. If our hearts are wicked, it will be revealed through our words and actions. He is reminding us what is most important to God. Well, let's be clear, we're not just talking about swearing here. Any words that harm or denigrate others or ourselves or speak of anything that we put ahead of God in our hearts, our money, our status, anything that separates from God is a problem. I think Jesus is asking us to look into our own hearts as well. And when we do, what do we find? Are we ever being as hypocritical as the Pharisees? Do we like to be seen performing rituals and disregard the purpose of it? What are the things we love more than God? If our hearts are hardened and closed, wicked thoughts easily take root. Our words and actions do not glorify God, they dishonor God. These thoughts and actions are what defile a person to turn our hearts away from God is, as one commentator put it, the most damning of all sins. We may not use the same words today, but humans haven't changed much in 2,000 years. The same things can infect us. Greed, avarice, and lack of sexual restraint are rampant today. And I suspect it may be harder to deflect these wicked ideas now than ever before because we see and hear them on all day on television and movies, on social media, it's easy to become desensitized. Slowly they become more normal and even more acceptable. And let's be honest, this kind of sin can be seductive. Sin isn't always ugly and it may appear fun, but it is always corrosive to our spirits. It damages our relationship with others and separates us from God. Jesus is asking each of us to cleanse our own hearts and clothe ourselves in righteousness. Now, my friends, there's good news and bad news. First, the bad news. We are human beings and sinful by nature. Not a one of us is immune. So what are we to do? How are we supposed to deal with this? Well, the companion verse in the lectionary from the book of James gives us some useful instruction. The author tells us this, you must understand this, my beloved brothers and sisters, let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to anger. For human anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness and welcome with meekness the implanted word that forever has the power to save your souls. I would also add, be quick to forgive. Now for the good news, we have Christ to follow. We attend worship, we study the Bible, we pray to train our minds and hearts. Here in the sanctuary, we are reminded constantly that our hearts are purified through Christ. Christ is that word imprinted on our hearts. When we let him dominate our thoughts, we let him guard our hearts against wickedness and kinder words and deeds do follow. Only a few moments ago, we came to this font and confessed our sins to God and one another. In this ordinary water that makes extraordinary promises, we were assured that we have been forgiven and that God forgets our sins. We get a fresh start. We renew our efforts to live a more holy life and it is a continual process that will last our lifetimes. We can only seek progress, not perfection. And because we are human beings, being free from evil thoughts isn't always our default setting. I can't speak for you, but I suspect we're a lot alike. Following Christ isn't a passive activity. It doesn't happen while we watch TV from our easy chairs. If it did, I'd be the holiest person in here. We have to be proactive and intentional in following Christ. When we are proactive, 
Working to keep our hearts clean, we have greater empathy and love for others. We no longer need to judge them or condemn them. We learn to see them as God does, as beloved children, no more, no less than any of us. We worry less about our neighbor's defiled hands than the fact that he's homeless or outcast or sick. He isn't one of us, loves differently than we do, or supported the wrong candidate. Would we welcome that person into our sanctuary? So yes, cleanliness is next to godliness, my friends, as long as it's our heart that we keep clean. And yes, you should still wash your hands. But I urge you to follow Christ for a cleaner heart. Cling to him, reach out to him and touch his robe. Let him be the word implanted in your heart. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. And may all of your thoughts, words, actions, deeds show love for one another and glorify God. Amen.